tapes that I've entitled The Holy Grail of Thor. To me, this is the most exciting evidence that I have ever run across. And I hope and I pray that you'll bear with me that I can get it across to you. Now, we use three tapes in order to prove from three different ancient sources of a mystery that's been lost to modern man for thousands of years. Now, it, when you first listen to this, I agree that there's going to be areas of it that may seem to uh, a, a bit dry. But you may have to go over it, you the listener, as a lot of this is going to go over people's heads because of their unfamiliarity with the lost subject as to man's beginning. We, we present some evidence that 999 out of 1,000 people, if not more, maybe 1 in 10,000, have never heard of the evidence that we are going to present. But we have endeavored to give proof from three different sources that at first they may seem unrelated. But upon you listening carefully, I believe you're going to understand things that have been hid from man for at least 5,000 years and more as to his original roots from among the stars. And of our uh, eventual return and uh, the next few months, I think that uh, uh, they're going to prove that our hope for peace is in vain. Trusting in the arm of flesh, meaning our reliance upon our so-called sophisticated weapons of war, and I prophesy this, that they will utterly fail us as many other people already believe. We will present evidence from records of over 5,000 years ago and older of the first ancient kings who settled on this planet, and they formed the ancient civilization of India and Indra and the ancient kings uh, who inhabited India before its present inhabitants and from the Kish Chronicles and the old people that were called Vikings and Dane from uh, Denmark, which is erroneous. Actually, it's Dan's Mark. And we're going to prove from the astronomy, not astrology, friends. I'm not trying to teach astrology. But we will prove from the astronomy of the ancient past that we believe that uh, can be easily, uh, once you listen to our evidence, can be traced back to Enoch, the one that was called a seventh from the Adam. When the Bible speaks of Jude and others that uh, quote from these ancient uh, uh, texts that tells of fallen races who came from beyond the stars. Now, if you don't believe that, you got to throw your book away. I didn't write the book. It's there, and it's quite obvious. And all of this is going to lead us back to the very house, or what I refer to as a space station. I believe that we can prove that it transported people, possibly you know millions of them, from deep space to this galaxy. But then after they arrived here, they started to war among themselves and they re rebelled against the mighty Lord of space and his house or space station. I think that this is quite clear that even the average reader can understand the Bible on this. Called the Holy Bull of Space and the ancient etymology of the language showing our direct descendants of King Arthur, who in fact meant the bull who came from space. They're going to be quick to deny this evidence as most superstitious people of the mindset of this confusing, nebulous, uh, differing opinions of, say, raptures and snatched away and those that believe that our only way that we're going to meet St. Peter is by dying when they go to meet him at the Golden Gate, but I wish they would show me that in Scripture. In other words, their minds are made up, so please don't confuse me with the facts. They ignore the past and... They are therefore blind to the future, for I maintain for a long time the end of the circle is the beginning. It <clears throat> tells us in the Scripture that in the beginning everything was perfect. Now where was this? It said in the garden. The next question, where was it? Your progenitors were kicked out of it, uh, of whence obviously or had to be somewhere in heaven or space, and a lot of people get mental indigestion indigestion over that and they ignore the fact that this planet's in space and if we were staying on a planet somewhere else in space would refer to the blue planet this earth or house or planet in outer space but the religious ignore the possibility why because of the priestcraft who invented their unprovable theories they were never based on fact because the faithful were afraid to question their factless theories 
as the fearful and the superstitious and uh, they were afraid for their immortal souls that uh, were hung in the balance by the threads of doubt and superstitious and they were manipulated like puppets by a priestcraft. So the mighty priestcraft were to cut the threads of their doubt uh, they would find that their mortal soul might end up burning in hell. And then the priestcraft came up with another doozy. They called it purgatory, where you'd go. Uh, they didn't want you to really go to hell because there wasn't any profit in it. But these spiritual leaders who wanted you to believe <clears throat> in uh, some disembodied, nebulous, nothing world that the deniers of you being restored to a physical body and returning to rule in a physical body in a world or over worlds, they had an easy out for your... <clears throat> uh, they, they, they gave the religious world an easy out, let's say. For if your soul was uh, landed in some sort of Dante's Inferno, then you would go to your priest, and uh, some old peasant father and his floor-scrubbing mom, they could buy you out for 10% down, and easy monthly payments. In other words, they could buy your soul back and get you out of purgatory, and then you could go with the rest of God's little honey to their version of heaven. So then we found that the coffers and the purses of the priestcraft became as fat as the priests. So today we have a new breed with new tactics. They employ crying and begging and and telling you that the science and the history of the Old Testament was cut off at the cross. And then uh, when you get to the John of Revelation, you try to tell them uh, that this John of the New Testament, who tells of the holy city, its size, location, and purpose, and who's to go there or to return to the original home, we find they ignore that, and they call it a mystery or one of the, uh, shall we say, the great unknowns, but yet you say to the priestcraft, uh, this runs parallel to what we find in the Old Testament. You see, well, just exactly how did all this come about? My friends, because of religion. Please don't get me wrong. I believe in, I revere, and I bow the knee to Jesus Christ as a God, uh, Emmanuel, who came in the flesh, he died for us. I believe the whole book. But I do not believe in most men's interpretation because once you go to check them out, they do not fit. Now today we find that we're not to teach religion. We're not allowed to pray in school. Because you see, my friends, we fail to understand that the uh, school of the state it is the state's religion. And they take these fertile young minds who are inquisitive, who are anxious to learn, and they bore them to death. They ignore their uh, history and the great glories of the past, and they, uh, they want the children to ignore the greatest historical book of all time that speaks of their progenitors and from whence they came and what they're supposed to be doing and where they're supposed to be going. So if you believe in a devil or an adversary, I would say it appears very much like he's ruling the uh, uh, world right now and he's teaching his religion. <clears throat> we find that the compulsory education, or shall we say the atten uh, attendance at the what I would call educational mills, uh, where the uh, receive theories and notions of the time are presented to the innocent as established facts. They encourage such total false impressions of the past that it becomes hardly possible to understand the present or to foresee the future, and with every approach to knowledge guarded by a formidable array of would-be experts and bibliographies and the... Uh, student here, he might possess sharp wits and unnaturally developed uh, skepticism, and if he were, if he's not to fall victim to one of these, uh, one or the other, let's say, of these rival schools of old, archaic, worn-out uh, man's interpretation or dogma and of uh, secular and ecclesiastical, uh, which, though mutually exclusive, unite instinctively 
to frustrate every attempt to avoid together the established uh, orthodoxy. In other words, that's a bozo no-no. Now we find that it was even defined by Einstein as a collection of prejudice which were fed to us with a porridge spoon or uh, like one uh, TV commentator uh, that you might have watched, he talks about these bunch of pablum pukers. Now we find that we're fed all of this nonsense before 18th year and we're not to go out and inquire of new things. We're supposed to stick with the old orthodox rule. Now nowhere in the tyranny of this pennant more evident than in the, uh, shall we say, the study of human origins and sacred history. Now most books about the, mo uh, about the remote past, they lie upon their authority as nothing more uh, than uh, substantial, let's say, than the uh, preconception of their authors. Inevitably influenced by these misapplied theories of uh, Marx and Freud and Darwin and their corrupt traditions of the uh, would-be pseudo-Christian churches. We are thus conditioned at a very early age to accept a very narrow linear view of history according to which civilizations uh, uh, is a recent and unique development. In other words, there wasn't any until we developed this uh, free promiscuous society that we're dwelling in and then when the sand hits the fan and they start sending our sons home once again in body bags we're going to wonder what's wrong with God well God didn't do it it's the clowns in Washington that think more of of uh, the black gold the oil which we supposedly only get 5% of it out of uh, uh, this area of Kuwait but uh, the cost of blood mixed with that oil, that doesn't count because your sons and your daughters do not mean anything to them at all. So as I say, getting back to our point, so uh, thus we are conditioned at a very early age to accept this very narrow view of history according to which civilization uh, they would have us believe it's a very recent and unique development now for the first time becoming universally established. The difficulty which arises in uh, uh, contesting the point of view are formidable. We are brought up in a secular tradition which imposes the strict limitation of thought and language necessary for its own survival. Now a few people have the time or the inclination to examine evidence which might disturb the settled convictions to which they have grown accustomed. The majority of the masses, they must rely upon information uh, based on the opinions of the professional critics uh, who are naturally inclined to tend their own gardens, to preserve therein their neatly arranged hierarchies of familiar ideas and to weed out all that fail uh, to accord the uh, or go to the uh, according to the prevailing order. Obviously, those who feel qualified to act as critics uh, are not, as a general rule, uh, people who have experienced deeply the uncertain and irrational aspects of nature, uh, which, according to Bishop uh, Berkeley, uh, makes the philosopher so much less confident and... Uh, uh, contented than his fellows. In consequences, they retain in the mature life the adolescent ability to adopt a committed uh, position to debate and put forward the decided uh, uh, opinions on issues which wiser men would scarcely feel disposed to judge. It is not an easy matter to question the ideas into which one is educated from our infancy to doubt the pretentiousness of the current fashionable authorities. Neither is it desirable for anyone whose way of life depends upon the favors of the literary or the academic world that uh, he should do so. Now the critics, therefore, he finds himself in the position all too often uh, in accordance with his own inclination of defending the orthodox notion of uh, his time and the devices traditionally used against us would-be her uh, heretics and 
those that cause derision and the uh, they have their self righteous abuse and uh, uh, unverifiable assertions that they've uh, put on us for all of these decades, uh, well, going back centuries, many of them, and they uh, they have the exaggerated respect which is now accorded to the intellectual trick of expressing these instant opinions on irresolvable topics uh, which may seem strange to those who've discovered the uh, tenuous nature of the assumption on which the modern sciences are based. Now who have come to understand the, uh, uh, well, those of us, let's say, that uh, we've come to an understanding that we find a lot of justice in the claim of Socrates, that uh, he was considered by the oracle the wisest man because he alone realized he knew nothing. Nothing is still the sum total of all that is known uh, for certain about the circumstance uh, on light, uh, of life on earth, let's say, and nothing is likely to remain as long as these artificially manufactured patterns of thought are applied to the interpretation of organic processes. Uh, the intellect is the most splendid of human proce- uh, properties and, and the force behind all positive action. But it seems we've become spiritual and mental pygmies because we've been thwarted by those in authority. Like, uh, I was quite shocked by the idea. I hadn't considered it. But the other day, uh, my son-in-law, uh, son-in-law, he became uh, very shocked when it dawned on him. He had a realization uh, that we have a class society now. Uh, we have those who are in power and uh, uh, those politicians. And beneath them are us peasants on whose backs they walk and and feed them and keep them in power uh, just like the ecclesiastical hierarchy. And so now we're be- going to become uh, no longer uh, the lower class, the middle class, and the filthy rich. Now we just have the rich and the very poor on the bottom. But we find that it's so sad that the electrical power, the intellect is uh, required to uh, fertilize and refine the imagination. Invoked on its own behalf, the outcome is sterility of understanding that leads to blind and destructive action. We find the teachers and the centers of education throughout the world, such as that that was founded by uh, Pythagoras at uh, Croton, understood that it's impossible for anyone to learn anything until he's experienced its truth for himself and therefore uh, set their pupils to practice the uh, arts of uh, dynamic geometry in order to exercise the facilities of intuition uh, through which may be uh, they may apprehend, shall we say, the essential laws of the cosmos and the motions and all of the great science. Now these institutions and their personal opinions and systems of belief, uh, however ingeniously contrived, were disregarded the conflicts of ideas as was seen as one manifestation of... Uh, of all of these beginnings that we, we try to put upon the people because we're disturbing the orthodox uh, world of, uh, of uh, their scientific opinion, which, although brilliant in many areas, are so limited, and if they can only uh, go through the Scriptures and understand these hidden secrets, uh, then there's worlds and goals that we could obtain. But with our uh, negative mindset, uh denying and disregarding the laws of the universe and of nature and shall we call them the spiritual laws and these pasteurized pastors who come up with this hogwash that were not under the law. Uh, they don't understand the Bible. It's broke down in statutes, judgments, ordinances, ritual, and sacrifice. And the ordinance of ritual contained in the sacrifice. They can't comprehend. The only part that was done away with was the a perpetual yearly sacrifice of a lamb. Because if we continue in that, then we deny that the Messiah has come. And they quote you the mistranslated English from the Greek uh, where Christ said, I have come to uh, fulfill the law. 
Well, in the Greek, what it said, he came to fully teach. And he talked about he didn't come to change one jot nor one tittle. And he said, heaven and earth will pass away before the law does. And we're going to get into this. And uh, why else has Christ got the right to come and judge the nation? So the enemies of society and of the people are uh, are these pasteurized pastors that uh, they don't understand. They don't comprehend the uh, the Bible. They don't comprehend the antiquities. They don't look outside the other Bible, uh, the Bible, and consider the other races and their nations and their myths and their history and their philosophy. Uh, they they shouldn't be afraid of it because if if their book is true, it should help verify it. So to you, the listener, many times you probably, if you think about it, want to equate yourself to John in the wilderness. In the Bible, the one that baptized Christ, he was defined as a voice crying in the wilderness. And today the world has turned into a wilderness, uh, spiritually speaking, so to speak. And we find that here, all of this terrible thing in the Middle East, we're sending three quarters of our marine to the uh, Middle East to sit there in the sand dunes uh, to eventually, I'm afraid, to be wiped out as they're sitting in the middle of the old Ottoman Empire, and the preachers, they remain silent, like the Scripture says, where are the watchmen on the wall? And uh, I think if you were to ask a lot of the young people today going through high school, and uh, probably many of those in college, you've asked them, did you ever read Gibbon's uh, uh, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire? Most of them would probably say they had never heard of it. And so the only thing that we seem to learn by history is the fact that we don't learn by history. And so we find uh, several thousand years the uh, rule of Egypt and the mysterious people who inhabited that land at different ages. I find a very interesting article here found in the National Geographic of November 1990. And if I may quote from page 98, uh, they speak of the different periods of rules by different races who were to take over Egypt. And as we said before, the where they speak of the Hyksos or the shepherd kings, a very mysterious people that came in and they shut up the temples and they drove out the astrologers and the soothsayers and the diviners and the superstition. In other words, they put them all out of business and they rule for a long period of time and then they suddenly disappeared as they suddenly came. But uh, from this page 98, uh, they say, uh, far to the south of Egypt along the Isles, great uh, uh, Minder lay the heartland of an ancient African kingdom of which we have heard and must remain uh uh, much remains to be learned. The Egyptians who conquered it in the 16th century uh, B.C. and ruled and exploited it for 500 years called it Cush. Wretched, uh, wretched Cush. They both loathed and dreaded this land of whirring wings. Sounds to me like somebody came in great ships from the stars and came to this land. It goes on to say, With a people tall and smooth skin, feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech, as the biblical prophet Isaiah would describe it. Now, I think there's a clue there that we might have overlooked. A people tall and smooth skinned. Now, were they talking about some people that came from the stars that had eternal youth, as they did not have the large pores that Many of us uh, gain as we uh, grow older. Then they go on to say, Pharaoh Tutankhamun had images of the black-skinned Cushites embroidered on his soles of his sandals and carved on his footstool so he could perpetually trample on them. Then in the 8th century B.C., Egyptianized Cushite kings turned the world upside down. They conquered Egypt. They established a vast a riverine empire extending from the uh, confluence of the Blue and White Nile to the Mediterranean. 
Historians have counted these Cushite kings as Egypt's uh, 25th. So we find that different periods of time that there was mysterious people who came in and took over these lands. So it would appear to us that uh, so-called racism, as they call it today, is nothing new. That throughout antiquity, throughout all of the most historical records, you saw examples of all of the different races uh, hating one another and being at war because of religion and race. And I believe that it shall continue till the time of Christ's return. But let's turn now to Bullinger on this old book that I have in my possession. He starts back on page 120. He talks about the sign of Taurus, the bull. Or uh, Taurus, as some would say. It's pronounced many different ways. Uh, he says that it's, uh, the picture is that of a bull rushing forward with mighty energy, with fierce wrath, and his horn set so as to push his enemies and pierce them through and destroy them. Now, this is one of the uh, heavenly signs that we find that the astronomers still quote today, but I think that they have lost the real meaning of it. It's referring to a house. It's referring to a great space station. But, oh, no, that couldn't be because surely God is not as intelligent. He's not as intellectual as us. And none of our progenitors back in antiquity could have built a great space station the size of this planet because here we uh, cooperating with Russia we're going to put one up uh, called Freedom that'll house I don't know 8 or 10 men starting with but uh, now this back in antiquity why do we ignore this and why do we ignore the fact that there was those that are more intelligent than us but let's go see what this bull has to do with the Messiah uh, the coming judge of the earth it is a prophecy of Christ, the coming judge and ruler and Lord of all the earth. So Bollinger says in his account, he goes on to tell us the Egyptian zodiac of Dendra already 4,000 years ago had forgotten the truth as to which the prophecy had referred and called him Isis. Now we find back in antiquity we hear about Isis uh, the Queen Isis, in other words, who was one of the daughters of this ancient name referred to uh, referred to Venus uh, in, in actuality, but this has been forgotten and lost for centuries now. And <clears throat> you might remember that Cleopatra was called uh, the daughter of Isis. She was referring to the fact in great antiquity that she was one of the descendants of the great princesses or daughters of uh, Isis or Venus. But anyway, let, let me go back. I might have lost, you know. We find the Egyptian zodiac of Dendra, as I said, 4,000 years ago. They had already forgotten the truth back then as to the prophecy which referred to and called him Isis. Uh, its original meaning was who saves or delivers. And, and Aphis, the head or chief. The bull is clearly represented in all of the zodiac, which has come down to us as all is always in the act of pushing or rushing. Now, the name of the sign in uh, the Chaldee is Tor, T O R, uh, hence it's Aramaic, uh, Al Thor. Now, keep this in mind, and we're going to prove a little later that this corrupted rendition of King Arthur and the round table. You see, they distorted the great uh, historical facts and the meaning, so it has no real meaning to us anymore. But this is going to substantiate and get into some things that I, I found them a mind blower. I found it really exciting. Uh, so since uh, in, in the Aramaic it was Althor, T-H-A-U-R. The Greek was uh, Tauros. T-A-U-R-O-S. The Latin was uh, Taurus. T-A-U-R-U-S. And on and on. So we find the more common Hebrew name 
was Shur, S-H-U-R, uh, which comes from a root which means both coming and ruling. Now there are several Hebrew words for bull and oxen, but the common poetical term of all is reem, R-E-E-M, conveying the idea of great loftiness, exaltation, power, and preeminence. We find the root in, in other kindred language, uh, or languages, I mean to say, such as the Etruscan and the Sanskrit. And it can be traced in the name of Abram, which means preeminent or high father, uh, uh, Rama, R-A-M-A-H, means high places and so forth. Though we find the star in Taurus, it represents a brilliant sight. Now there are at least 141 stars besides two important group of stars which both form integral parts of the sign of uh, Taurus or the bull here. And I would suspect that there's a great possibility that it was 144 stars which may have something to do and allude to this mysterious number of the 144,000 of the rulers of the new heavenly Jerusalem, the house of the Almighty, which is spoken of by John in Revelations. But we find the brightest star in the bull's eye has a Chaldean name, uh, which means al dub D-E-B-A-R-A-N, and it means the leader or governor. The star B at the tip of the left horn, it has an Aramaic name, it's uh, El-Nath, N-A-T-H-E-L-N-A-T-H. -E it mean, uh, its meaning is wounded or slain. Now keep this in mind, my friends, because I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt this is going to tie in with something that we will find in the apocryphal writings that those of the ancient days, and who knows when all, all of this really started, but we know that all of these signs in the heaven, these astronomical signs and names which the scientists still use, but they have entirely lost the original intent and meaning of these things that is prophetical, that talks about a time of the restoration of this world and the restoration of the people to their uh, perspective homes and, and, well, as Christ put it, in the Father's house are many mansions. He said, I go now to prepare a place for you also, that where I might be in outer space and other planets that you might be also. But keep this in mind about the wounded bull, because unfortunately, uh, many people uh, who were uh, very intent, very in sincere, and they were great students of the ancient astronomy. Now, we're not teaching astrology, because you remember, as you look back, uh, Israel uh, was very conversant, and they understood the stars. They understood their meanings. They could look to the stars. That was the second Bible. It was the second witness uh, to the glory and greatness of the Almighty. But unfortunately, as time slipped by and knowledge got lost and faded into the fog of antiquity and ignorance and superstition as priestcraft took over, all of this was lost. But they thought that it was Christ. Well, they were wrong, my friends, because the book of Revelation refers to Christ as the Lion of Judah, he who is the scepter lion, uh, he who held the authority. But anyway, so we go on. That, as I said before, the star B, at the tip of the left horn, it has an Aramaic name, El Nath. It means wounded or slain. No, it was not slain. It was uh, merely wounded. But they tried to slay or, in other words, destroy the bull or this space station, the very house of the Almighty. Now we find another prophetic uh, intimidation uh, that hit, uh, this coming Lord uh, should be first slain as a sacrifice. Not the bull, it was the lion. But then there's a cluster of stars known as the Pleiades. And have we not 
I referred you on many occasions to the Pleiades. Now the word which uh, means the congregation. It's talking about a group of people of the judge or ruler. I think that it was, uh, what was it, Isaiah or Ezekiel 14 that we quoted to you about Job and about Noah who were in it. And then it goes on to say uh, Daniel was also in it. These three. And so they missed the part there. They haven't bothered to look it up in the original language. You get a strong concordance and you look up that name Daniel, which is not referring to Daniel at the lion's den because uh, there was a separation of several hundred years in between and there was no connection that we find the word uh, Daniel there, which is spelled different, as I said. If you look it up in the original language, it means the judge. And so there, let me repeat it. Then there is a cluster of stars known as the Pleiades, the word which means the congregation of the judge or the ruler. And it comes to us through the Greek Septuagint as the translation of the Hebrew uh, K-I-M-A-H, uh, uh, Kima, which means the heap or accumulation. And we find this occurs in Job 9.9. And let's see, uh, 35, 38, and 31, 32, and also Amos's 5, 8. Now I want to go back and, and take just a second to do a little review here. I think that's so utterly fantastic that Bullinger, who wrote this down and put this all in concise order, as he got it from the lady and he rearranged it to where it made more sense, and it was in more of a, uh, say, a proper chronological order. But unfortunately, Bullinger, in his day and age, he was not exposed to uh, the premise that we're trying to put across to you here, but to review that cluster of stars known as the Pleiades. Now the word, it also it means the congregation of the judge or the ruler as he explains, as it was taken from the Greek. And so Bullinger and nobody until this time, as far as I'm aware of, they have ever tied this together with the Scripture when the Almighty comes back and he talks about the myriads of his saints that he will bring with me. He said, I'll bring 10,000 times 10,000 times the stars which are in heaven. He talks about his saints, his santos, his believing all springs is going to come back with he who is to be the ruler, as John of Revelation talks about, said he'll be king of kings and lord of lords, and he's bringing a great multitude of saints back with him that I believe, uh, bringing them back. In other words, they had to be here before. These were the very people that took part in the first resurrection. As we get into those tapes, we're going to give it uh, uh, some definite rule here. Now, as we go back and we've quoted from uh, Job 9.9 9 and uh, also Job uh, 38 and verses 31 and 32 and Amos and verse 5, uh, it consists of a number of stars in the neck area found in the uh, planetary configurations here of Taurus, uh, which appears to be near together. The brightest of them marked in all of the maps. Now remember, my friends, uh, the Hebrews, the Chinese, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, all of these ancient nations and empires of any uh, size whatsoever, they all had the maps of the stars, and apparently all of the ancients had this knowledge, and apparently that even some of the astronomer priests that were probably under Herod, they went to him and they told him, uh, Sir, you are in big trouble. Uh, because uh, apparently they knew how to read the stars, the astronomy. Uh, they knew how to read. They were aware of the ancient prophecies without getting into it. But a uh, uh, star there is equated to Aquilus, uh, the eagle. And it talks about when it was to move into the head of 
uh, the stars that make up Virgo, which is equated to Virgo the Virgin. Then after a lengthy period of time, it was the drop down in the womb area, that cluster of stars of Virgo the Virgin. Then they knew that this was the exact time in recorded history that the Messiah should appear. But anyway, the brightest of them, as I said, that are marked in all the maps has come down to us with the Aramaic name El Sion, C-Y-O-N-E, which means the center, and has given the idea to some astronomers uh, that it is the center of the whole universe. Now the Syriac name for the uh, uh, Pleiades is Sukoth, S-U-C-C-O-T-H, which means Boos. In other words, my friend, Boos, tents, tabernacles, and for those who say that we're not under the law and the Almighty did not mean for us to be under the law, I'm not going to take the time to look it up for you, but he, he does talk about those nations who do not keep the Feast of Tabernacles that he said he will not give them rain in due season. Apparently he's going to give them a second chance. Those who do not go and submit themselves to the house of the Almighty, uh, like Revelations talks about those that will flow unto it. In other words, fly to it. Whole nations said they're going to take the gifts to the very house of the Almighty. And my friends, it's not going to be in Israel. It's not going to be anywhere on this planet whatsoever. But he talks about those who will not bend to his will, that he will eventually destroy them from the very uh, face of this earth. Now we have another group of stars on the face of the bull, which is known as the Hades. H-Y-A-D-E-S. Now a lot of people uh, have thought for a long time this meant this eternal burning and uh, hell that these fire insurance preachers uh, preach, if you don't turn, you're going to burn, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to Hades. That was used when I was a youth. You don't hear that term used much anymore. Uh, but he goes on to say, which has the similar meaning of the congregated. Now, I would like to quote to you from Bullinger's footnotes here. He says, the others have names, but they were given by the Greeks from the names of the seven daughters of Atlas and Phleon, F-L-E-I-O-N-E or Philoni. The uh, Hades were their sisters. Together they tell us that the saints will be secure with this mighty Lord when he comes to rule. Now we can see the allegory there because in our Christian accepted literature, which most of the denominational uh, people accept, uh, they talk about the Almighty coming for His bride. Now, uh, he also has this footnote. He goes on to say the Pleiades and Hades are sometimes spoken of as constellations. But this is a mistake. He says they are integral parts of Taurus. So, it's most likely there that he's talking about he's bringing some of his other bride back with us. Well, anyway, uh, we go on now. The other stars not identified are named uh, P-A-L-I-L-I-C-I-U-M. It's Hebrew uh, belonging to the judge. And then we have the word Wasat, W-A-S-A-T. It's Aramaic, and it means the very center or foundation. Uh, then there's the another Aramaic word, al thor Aya, T H U R A I Y A, and it's Aramaic. It means the abundance. And then we have uh, Virgilice, I believe you would pronounce it, V E R G I L I C E. It's Latin. Uh, it means the center. The Aramaic means the vertex turned on, rolled around, rolled around as. Uh, descriptive of a planet or a great round space station like the earth turning in space or coming from space. 
in close proximity in a given time in the future, maybe in the very near future when the Almighty intercedes. And this is how He will bring His great congregation with Him and His warships and other accompanying personages. But it seems that everything points to the appointed uh, important truth and all turns on the fact that the Lord is coming to rule. This is a central truth of all prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All hope for creation, all hope for the world, all hope for Israel, all hope for the church turns on this, that Jesus is coming again, and that when He comes, His saints, the daughters of the King, like the Pleiades and Hades, will be with Him. This is, uh, this is what Bullinger has to say. He suspected it, but he never understood that it was a, a great space station. He and these people throughout time, they've got this mindset that angels are nothing but ethereal spooks that can uh, suddenly appear with chicken wings on their back and they can uh, uh, materialize and then poof, dematerialize. And, and so many people misquote Scripture and they don't... of these people they've got this idea that God is a ghost he's a spook he's the Holy Ghost he's the Holy Spirit they don't know the difference between uh, spirit and ghost as it's rendered and its original significance but uh, as he said before he made us in his image body soul and spirit and we find the accounts we go back and quote Abraham and Gideon and those who sat down and ate with these angels, extraterrestrial messengers. They ate with them and they talked with them. And we find that Christ, after the resurrection, uh, He ate bread and He ate fish and He drank wine. And He walked and He talked with His servants and His disciples. And He ascended back into the celestial plains, the outer space. And as He said, As you have seen Me go, so shall you see me come. And so, my friends, he talks about people reproducing uh, numbers and offspring of children that are countless and without end. That his plans, he makes it quite clear, nobody's ever understood it, that they're going to populate planets and worlds uh, without end in sidereal systems beyond the scope of our uh, telescopes and our understanding uh, but anyway, let's go back to this now. So, if he's real, if we are going to re-inherit our bodies and we're going to be resurrected to continue on into immortality and have eternal life, why else then could we ever uh, uh, migrate to and populate and become pilgrims on other planets because otherwise uh, what futility it would seem that we do the old uh, uh, three score and ten and then we die on en route to the stars and uh, the only way we could ever hope of getting any seed or sons to those planets that would uh, we would have to train our offspring hopefully en route to them or else uh, our spaceship would be floating around out there in space just empty derelicts so we're going to have to change our uh, mindset and some of these archaic, outmoded, ignorant ideas that come to us from the Dark Ages, uh, still perpetrated by these, uh, as the Bible calls them, hirelings. Now, I'm not degrading all preachers, but I say if you're honest and you understand this, then it's about time you pick up the ball and carry it a while. Now, everything seems to point to the important truth and all turns to the fact that the Lord is coming to rule. This is the central theme of all prophecy and the testimony of Jesus as the spirit of prophecy. All hope for creation and hope for the world and hope for Israel and the church 
all turns on this, that Jesus is coming again, and when he comes, his saints, the daughters of the king, like the Pleiades and Hades, will be with him. Uh, there is nothing of the church revealed here. Uh, as uh, Bollinger, they uh, had this idea that the church would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and to be forever with the Lord. And he quotes us 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, 4.17. But my friends, if you really think that belonging to one of these liberal denominations that will not take a stand at this time. They won't take a stand against abortion. Uh, they won't take a stand against homosexuality. Uh, they won't uh, protest about this terrible war that uh, uh, their children are going to be sacrificed on the bayonets of uh, the adversary there in uh, uh, the, the deserts. My friend... Why in God's name would he want to save a sorry bunch of people like us? So, my friends, the word church there, as it's used erroneously, we go back uh, from A.D., around uh, 69 A.D., up into around the 3rd century after Christ, and you go up into the British and the Scottish Isles, and especially in Scotland, they founded uh, the, the first true churches. The people were called the church, the ecclesia, the kaya, the kahal, the called out ones, called out from superstition, called out from the bondage of denominationalism and men's views that in most cases were diametrically opposed to what is written in the book, brought from the messengers from the stars to the prophets of God and handed down to us until distorted by the priestcraft. So he's not talking about snatching up a bunch of denominational people. Now, before it goes on to say, thus before he comes into the world in judgment, he will come forth to receive the number of his body unto himself. It is quite clear in these scriptures, before he thus comes within to destroy all of his uh, enemies and to judge, rule the world in righteousness, then we read this sign of uh, Taurus. Therefore, we are to understand that his church will be with him. Uh, now, this is what Bollinger saying, but what we're saying is the ecclesia, the called out, they'll be with him and safe from all judgment. So he tells us. So there's this old rapture theory has been around a long time. I'm not going to argue about it too strong. I used to be diametrically opposed to it, but I hope to God that this man is right. That there will not, that we will not have to stand here and be here during his judgment because as we've cited to you before, he said that he's coming back to make war against all the nations. Now this may upset some of you and I gotta confess to you that I have uh, gone back and forth on this issue trying to get it in my mind uh, to where I can understand it. But there's very much in the scriptures of the book as there is in the prophecies of the heavens about the coming of the Lord and judgment and about the time of his indignation for Enoch, <coughs> who doubtlessly was used in arranging these prophetic signs. Remember we said he's quoted in the book several different times, but these pastorized pastors, they have left the books of Enoch out of our Bible. And then in some cases, possibly rightfully so, but because we find a lot of these books of Enoch, they were written 4,000 years later. But, who else laid all of this deep knowledge down and understanding the prophecy of the stars, which, you know, it always says in the mouth of two to three witnesses. So you have the prophecy of the Bible, you have the prophecy of Jesus Christ and His saints and of His blood. But it say the books were all destroyed and we did understand the astronomy. Here it is all recorded in the heavens. So we have these prophetical uh, signs that were most likely they, they were taught by Enoch to all of the ancient nations. Remember, he was called the seventh from Adam. And so were these prophetic signs uttered the prophetic words, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of His saints to execute judgment upon all and to convict all that are ungodly. 
uh, you find this in the little uh, book there of uh, two pages, most of your bio. Uh, there's only one chapter in Jude 14 and 15. Now, uh, he goes on to say, we have said that at a very early period these signs were appropriated to the twelve tribes of Israel and born upon their standards, in other words, their flags, their emblems. Now, this may be uh, traced in the blessing of Jacob that we find back in Je uh, Genesis and in the blessings of Moses that we find in Deuteronomy, let's see, what was it, 33? Now, Taurus was a sign, or uh, Taurus or Taurus was a sign to Joseph, or rather to his two tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh like the powerful horns. Now, we will read to you as he quotes back then from Deuteronomy, uh, let's see, 33 and 17. The first of his bullock, and the marginal notes, uh, his first firstling bullock. These people were named after the great bull. The firstlings of his bullock. Majesty as he, and his horns are the horns of the wild ox. With them he shall push the people. Or in other words, then they put in parentheses also, my friends, it means gore. People do not understand that uh, they, they can't understand the idioms and the etymology of the ancient language. And they get confused. Like one minute they talk about the Lamb of God. As he was here like a little lamb that was led to the slaughter. But then it said he's coming back not as a lamb, but this time he's coming as a lion. It's also, as prophesied, he's coming like a bull. As we said, he's come back to war against all nations with them. He said he shall push and gore the people, all of them, even to the ends of the earth. Now let me read it again. The firstling of his bullock, majesty as he, and his horns of the wild ox. With them he shall push and gore the peoples, all of them, even to the end of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim. They are the thousands of Manasseh. So you see the young princes, the descendants, the Jehovah's, uh, meaning the great lords of the Almighty. They were equated to bulls. And we will go back later on as we get deeper into this. We're going to go back to the first book of Kings and we're going to show you that the great lords, the great sons of the Almighty that guarded the very house, they were going to prove who built it, where it came from, and some really wonderful information. And we'll find that even the watchers and the great ships of the watchers that tour the heavens at uh, speeds beyond light and our understanding and comprehension, they were also, as we get into the studies and the mysteries of the tabernacle that's laid down in the Old Testament, we find that they're referred to as bullocks that had wings on them, and also they refer to lions with wings on them used in the symbology in the tabernacle. But anyway, now, it is not, however, merely by man or men alone that this will be done. For David sings, Thou art my king, O God. Now, quoting uh, the King James Version here, instead of saying, O Yahweh. Through thee will he push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. We find this written in the book of Psalms. Then we go to Isaiah. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogance of the proud to cease. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through. We find this. We've taken it from the books of Isaiah also, speaking of that day, the Holy Spirit or the Great Spirit, the Almighty, uh, spoke this to Isaiah. For the Lord hath indignation against all of all the nations and fury against all their host. He shall utterly destroy them. 
He hath delivered them to the slaughter. The Lord has the sacrifice and Bozrah, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom, and the wild oxen, uh, the word in parentheses, the reem, shall come down with them, and the bullocks, plural, with the bulls, and their land shall be drunken with blood, and their dust made fat and fatness, for this is the day of the Lord's vengeance the year of recompense and the controversy of Zion. My friends, you see the controversy of Zion? There's people here on this earth who have established a religious and a political order and they claim that they are the true Zion. And then we have the Christian world who claim they are God's little honeys and because they profess the name of Jesus Christ they are the Zion or the government of God. But this controversy of Zion, this is what we're explaining to you. This is what we're showing you as to where it really is. And these bullocks and young bullocks and the bulls that are coming from there with the headmaster. <laughs> By the way, those that want to go look that up, that's found in Isaiah uh, 34. Uh, verses 2 to 8 from the Revised Version. And we want to remind you, you may want to go back and listen to, to some of your first tapes where we pl proved conclusively beyond the shadow of a doubt when the Almighty told him that this Mount Zion, this was his house, his holy hill, this was Eden, this was his home forever. And it's not here on this earth. I think we've proved that in other chapters. So we'll leave it alone. But to continue on, Behold, the Lord cometh forth out of His place. Out of His place. He has a place. He has a house. Uh, you've heard the expression, anybody said, You've been out to my new place? But here, Behold, the Lord cometh forth out of His place. Out of to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So we find this in Isaiah uh, 6.21. But my friends, let this be a warning to the religious leaders and to our political leaders. My friends, they have started something that they cannot finish. Speaking of the United States and that matriarchal society of England that is ruled by that loudmouth, arrogant woman who has got her nation into something that they shall not recover from until Christ comes. And I believe that this jihad, that uh, will be called the Holy War by these Muslims. And I believe they have a lot of reason as we don't have time and it's not the subject to go into the backstabbing that not only England and Europe and America has done to the Palestinians and to the Arab world and how we've lied and mistreated and deceived them when they've tried over and over uh, to be our friends. But we hear only the slanted side of the news. But my friends, every nation in this world is going to shed an ocean of blood. It's written. It started. And the Almighty is the author and the finisher. And He will come for the small remnant that's left alive like Jeremiah the prophet, who saw to these end times, he said, O oh God, hide me in the grave during the period of thy indignation. So, my friends, I hope, I hope to God that there is a rapture and that He in His infinite mercy who judges and knows the true heart of individuals. 
I don't even know myself or my own heart. I only guess at it. Only He knows the truth of each and every one of us. And we better pray there is some sort of a rapture. But I think, as it tells of the terror that is coming upon this earth, He says, and immediately after these days, then there will be the signs in the heavens of the coming of the Son of Man or the Son of Adam, talking and referring to about the Lion of Judah, the Messiah, uh, the Almighty's return. And he's going to go to war with these nations, 38th chapter of Ezekiel. But my American friends, I would say this to you. After all of our troops are wiped out and we lose our equipment, we've already got, or they're putting over three quarters of our Marine Corps force there. My friends, there's once in a while it slips out on TV. If this equipment and these troops are wiped out, we are left virtually defenseless. Talk about strategicians in Washington. Well, my God, man, they have even taken sending our reserves over there, which is illegal. And they're leaving us defenseless. This is why it tells us in Ezekiel, let us go up to the new and unwalled Jerusalem. It says, having neither bars nor gates. In the etymology and the ancient idioms of the language, it means they have no defense, no army. That's why it's kind of important, my friends, to think on these things, to build faith and understanding and get right with the Almighty. Repent and turn from our wicked ways. Second Chronicles 7.14 When my people which are called by my name, when they shall humble themselves and as a nation get upon their knees and call upon me, he said, then I will come and cleanse their land. My friends, I don't care how arrogant we are. He's going to take the ego and the arrogance and all of that out of us. And I tell you what, it'll go back like in the days of Lincoln after the Civil War when he called for a great day of prayer and fasting. Well, anyway, enough for the doom and gloom, but I figure somebody ought to tell. Then we have, or what we have here is the united testimony of the two revelations as is pictured in the heaven that's written in the book. It's a prophecy of a coming judge and of a coming judgment. It is, however, no mere bull that is coming. It is a man, a glorious man, even the Son of Man. And this first development shown in the first of the three constellations belonging to the sign Orion the coming prince uh, light breaking forth in the redeemer see this is where Christendom and today hey our young people a lot of them come out of school and we see these professional football and basketball players and uh, I think there's what two or three black fellas turned around and sued the college because they got out they didn't even know how to read because they seem to, the school seemed to think that uh, uh, that uh, sports was more important. So how can we expect the young people to think today when they can't read, when their vocabulary is limited? You don't have much of a word processor up there if you don't have anything contained in the banks and able to comprehend these things. My, what a sad situation that we're in. But when it speaks of Orion, the coming prince, light bringing forth, breaking forth in the Redeemer. The picture is to show... Well, wait, I, I didn't make my point there. I'm terribly sorry. But think about this. See, they get lost. One minute Christ is called uh, the Lamb of God, and then He's called, called the Lion of God, and then there's a lot of inference uh, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that talks about the bull and it talks about horns. And we hear about some guy that uh, rushed into the temple and died between the horns. And, and then due to this erroneous translation where Moses is cited in the New Testament, he, he came back from the house of the Almighty. That's right. He came back from outer space. And then the translators put in this garbledy gook. He had to put a towel or a blanket over his head 
because there was horns of light emanating from his head. It wasn't his head. It was horns of light that was emanating from this planet or this great space station. And then the translators did a real garbly goop job on us. And they said, because they had to hide the fact that the glory was fading from Israel. Because it said that every time the law was read, then there was a blindness came over their minds. My friends, once again, as Jeremiah from our Fentanyth chapter said, uh, and I'll paraphrase it, Woe be it upon the false pain of those scribes who distorted my holy word. All right, now back to Orion. But see, this is why they get lost when we change from one idiom, one allegory, uh, equating it to animals and all, because Christ in his time, he used us. This was before our machine age, when we were in love with nature, in love with the land, in love with our animals, and we had a close affinity to nature and animals because their livelihood depended on it. So, you see, our ancestors, most all of them, were peasants. That's not a bad word. It's an old meaning. It means farmers, agricultural people that were close to nature. And so when he equated it to animals and showed them signs of animals in the heaven, then they could follow it and they could understand it, and they had something to compare it to. Well, I hope I've cleared that up. Now back to Orion, the coming prince. Light breaking forth in the Redeemer. The picture is to show that the coming one is no mere animal but a man, a mighty, triumphant, glorious prince. He is so pictured in the ancient Dendra Zodiac that when we see a man coming forth pointing to the three bright stars, the Rigel, R-I-G-E-L, uh, the Bellatrix, B-E-L-L-A-T-R-I-X, and uh, Beltegues, B-E-T-E-L-G-U-E-Z, as his. His name is given as Hagata, H-A-G-A-T, which means this is he who triumphants. Now, my friends, you have to forgive me if I mispronounce some of these names, but you have to remember a lot of this is ancient Hebrew and it's ancient Greek and it's ancient Chaldean. And any of you that might be listening who are familiar with these things, please forgive me. But my friends, my pasteurized pastors that I sit under and my teachers that I sit under, they never taught me these things. They did not know about them apparently because they never alluded to them to me. So, I'm the best you got right now. If you hear somebody that can do a better job, you let me know and I'll go to him. So we find the hieroglyphic characters below, they read Or, O-A-R. Orion was anciently spelled uh, Orion, O-A-R-I-O-N. Now from the Hebrew uh, root, which means light. Remember what we said about the planet of light? Lucifer meaning a planet of light. So Orion means coming forth as light. In other words, his planet, his house is coming forth. That's one and the same. The one they call the bull. The one they call the house of the land. The one they call Venus, Lucifer, uh, Eden, paradise, third heaven. The ancient Akkadian was Urana. U R dash A N A. It means the light of heaven. My friends, let's don't spiritualize this. Let's don't allegorize this. Let's don't say this is a parable or a mystery. But he's trying to show you, like he said in Revelations, what is it? The very last verse, just about, that he said, uh, I am the bright and the morning star. And we know that the brightest star in our heaven to our planet is Venus. Well, we know it's not a star. Now, Orion is the most brilliant of all the constellations. Now, when he comes to the meridian, he is accompanied by several adjutant constellations of great splendor. There is then above the horizon the most glorious view of the celestial bodies that the starry firmament affords and the magnificent view is visible to all the inhabited world because the equinoctial line or the celestial uh, color uh, passes nearly through the middle of Orion. 
Aradius thus sings of him. Eastward, like, remember, uh, uh, Venus rises in east. Eastward beyond the region of the bull stands great Orion, and who, when night is clear, beholds him gleaming bright, shall cast his eye in vain to find a sign more glorious in all heaven. End of quote. Now this constellation is mentioned by name as being perfectly well known, both by name and appearance in the time of Job, as being an object of familiar knowledge. At that early period in the world's history, you go back and you see Job 9.9, 9, and let's see, 35, 36, 38, verses 31, and Amos, verses 8. And the Hebrew, it's uh, Cecil, C-H-E-S-I-L, which means a strong one, a hero, or giant. It contains 78 stars, two being of the first magnitude, four of the second, and four of the third, and 16 of the fourth. A little way below in the sword is a very remarkable nebula star. A common telescope will show that it is a be beautiful nebula. A powerful telescope reveals uh, as consisting of the collection of uh, nebula stars, uh, these again being surrounded by faint luminous points, as with more powerful uh, telescopes, uh, will resolve into uh, separate stars. Thus beautifully is set the brilliance and the glory of that light which shall bring forth when the moment comes where it is said, Arise and shine, for thy light is come. And the picture presents us with the light of the world. You remember back uh, as Christ picked up the uh, the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, when he went into the temple, and he said, Arise and shine, for thy light has come. He was the light of the world, the light of the planet Venus. He was uh, the householder of Venus. Nobody has ever understood this until this point. Now the picture reveals us with the light of the world. His left foot, now in this picture of a man standing out here, is significantly placed on the head of the enemy, and he's girded with a glorious girdle, a studied, a studded with three brilliant stars, and upon the girdle is hung a sharp sword. His handle proves that the mighty prince has come forth in a new character. He is again proved to be the lamb that was slain, uh, for the hilt of his sword is, uh, is in the form of the head and the body of a lamb. In his right hand he lifts up on high his mighty club, uh, while in his uh, left he holds forth the token of the victory, the head and skin of the roaring lion. And we ask and wonder, who is this? And the names of the stars give us the answer. The brightest in the right shoulder is named uh, Betelequiz, B-E-T-E-L-G-E-U-Z, -E -E which means the coming as in Malachi 3, 2, of the branch. The second B in the left foot is named Regal, R-I-G-E-L, or Regol, R-I-G-O-L, which means the foot that crushes. Now, it is lifted up and is placed immediately over the head of the enemy, as though in the act of crushing it. Thus the name of the star bespeaks the act. The next star and the left shoulder is called uh, Bellatrix, B-E-L-L-A-T-R-I-X, which means quickly coming or swiftly destroying. And the name of the fourth star, uh, one of the three in the belt, it carries us back to the old, old story that this glorious one was once humbled and that his heel had been crushed. You see, he who stepped down upon his footstool of the earth, he was crushed, he was killed by his adversaries. But it goes on, uh, that's telling his heel that was once bruised is named al Nitak, N-I-T-A-K, the wounded one. Similarly, the star in the right leg is called uh, S-A-I-P-H, 
safe uh, bruised, safe bruised, which is the very word used in Genesis 3.15, thus connecting Orion with the primeval prophecy like uh, Ophilicus, uh he has one leg that's bruised, while with the other he's crushing the enemy underfoot. This is uh, betokened by other stars not identified, named al Rai, R-A-I, who bruises, who breaks, as in uh, Cephas and in uh, Thibet. Hebrew means treading on. Other Aramaic names relate to his person. Al G I A U Z A Al Guza <laughs> Maybe you can understand it better than I can the branch is what it implies. Al Gibor the mighty Al Marzan the ruler uh Al uh, Nagjed N A G J E D the Prince Nephila N-I-P-H-L-A, it's uh, the Chaldee, it means the mighty. Nux in Hebrew, N-U-X, the strong. So you see from all of these cross-related languages and so forth, we understand that all of the nations through antiquity, they seem to know this in the ancient forgotten past. Now some names, they relate to his coming as Beltaquiza. B E T E L G E U S E and Bellatrix as above that we quoted and also Hika H E K A the Chaldee or the Chaldee which means coming and the Misa M E I S S A Hebrew meaning coming forth. Now such as a, a, cul- a cumulative a testimony of Orion stars, which day after day and night after night they show forth his knowledge. Uh, this testimony <clears throat> uh, was afterwards written in the book, The Prince of Glory, who was once wounded for the sins of his redeemed, is about to rise up and shine forth for their deliverance, and the redemption draweth nigh. Now we're quoting here from Isaiah. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have, he says, a long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. Now you see, a lot of people have failed to understand the womb of the morning. The Greeks called it the goddess of love, Venus. They failed to understand that the people in the house of the Almighty are like a pregnant woman groaning and travail. And the Revelation tells us those that are under the throne of the Almighty, another name for Venus, they're crying out, How long, O Lord? How long have we got to put up with these sorry bastards here on this earth that are manipulating us? I'm not being vulgar. That's what the the Hebrew calls the mamzers. These fallen angels, these bastards that are vexing men since time immortal. My friends, you think I'm rasty now. You wait till it hits home with you. I don't believe you'll be so pious and delicate. Then it will be said to his people in the setting of the prophecy and the beautiful interwoven structure as the beauty and the glory of the truth uh, is uh, it reveals. Now there's a lot of this that I won't break it all down. But he goes on to say, this is the glory of God which the heavens constantly declare as in uh, Psalms uh, 19 and 1. They tell of that blessed time when the whole earth shall be filled with His glory. And Numbers uh, numbers 14 and 21, I believe it is, and Isaiah 11 and 9, when the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. 
as Isaiah tells us, as we see now the beauty of Orion. Now, but side by side, the glory which the coming light of the world shall bring for his people, there is that wicked whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Hence, as in the concluding chapters of the first book, uh, <clears throat> which this third book is the expansion, we have in uh, uh, Lyra, L-Y-R-A, the harp, he says, I praise prepared for the conquer as in ara, A-R-A, which means a burning prior. As a consuming fire prepared for his enemies. And also, my friends, this burning prior, it, it, it also, uh, he didn't put it in here, Bullinger, but it refers to the altar turned upside down, pointing his flames towards this earth, that the, the house of the Almighty, John went there and all, he said he, he saw the altar of God, just another name for his house, and his point with flames towards this earth, talking about the judgment. We'll see a little bit more about that after a bit. And he talks about uh, a consuming fire prepared for his enemies. And so uh, he tells you that he pointed out in the first chapter of his book, we have Orion and uh, the glory that is prepared for the conquer in uh Ordanicus, E-R-I-D-A-N-U-S, and as the river of wrath prepared for his enemies. This brings us to Eranidus, uh, which means the river of the judge. We've all sang that uh, church song, Flow out mighty river to a dry and thirsty land. And he goes on and he, he speaks of the river of wrath breaking forth upon his enemies. It issues forth in all the pictures from the uh, downcoming foot of Orion while others sit in the ignorance of a fable story only the river Po or the river Euphrates. Uh, we see it from the beginning of its name and from the significance of its position. The river of the judge. I hope and pray, my friends, that you'll hang in there with me. But I think that there is something here, I must confess, is even beyond the scope of my imagination and my understanding. Like Paul said, I see through a glass darkly. I don't see it all. But as we're going to talk about this river that runs through heaven, Sometimes it's equated to like the great serpent as it traverses across the heavens and so forth. I believe, if, if you'll just bear with me and why I'm going into the detail of all of this, I think it'll prove my point beyond a shadow of a doubt that this knowledge, I believe, that uh, he has proven and has proven to me that this man who traversed heavens upon occasion like Elijah, who never saw death, whatever that means, the seventh from Adam, and I don't go along with the church theory, called Enoch. He brought down these great mysteries, and here we only have little clues and part as to what really went on. But you see, the religious world and man for the last 2,000 years has forgotten that this was a war and wars in great antiquity that went on between those who rebelled against the true king of heaven and his house. And literally, as we'll prove it to you, uh, we, we have all kind of evidence, if you'll bear with us, they tried to even blow his house out of existence. They destroyed the people on many planets. It was a great war that went on in antiquity and has carried down to the very day that we're living in. And I believe that there's a lot of descendants of these fallen Nephilim, as they're referred to, that are here on the earth that are still have not learned themselves by history that it is impossible for them uh, to conquer the king of space although they're going about like a rampant lion seeing whom they might destroy and proselytizing and corrupting the sons 
and the daughters of God who the only education comes off the eye of the beast as I call the boob tube. But I think that we'll prove that there was this great war in antiquity and is still being carried on to this day. And I think you, uh, in the latter days, uh, as it's referred to in Scripture, you're going to see the culmination of all of this. And the curtain is going to be drawn down on the last act to this great lengthy scenario, this war that has gone on for millenniums and millenniums. Now bear with me now, and we'll find some proof here. You may get tired and want to put this aside and, and go back to it again. And so maybe we'll just cut it off here and you can rest your mind, maybe want to listen to it uh, over again, and then go back, and, and then we'll get the connection uh, where he tells about this river and the people that fought against them, and stars and constellations and planets way on out farther in space that were connected with this that uh, even I have not dreamed of until this point. So we thank you for listening. In case you lose your tape, it's Pilgrim Ship P.O. Box, 1086 Lakeview, Missouri, 65737. This is tape two, and we're going to continue. We've entitled this little series, The Holy Grail of Thor, and we'll get to that after a bit, and we'll show you the connection. But I wanted to give you a background so you can understand what is meant by the bull. And why did the ancient people of Peru, the Aztecs, Toltecs, Incas, Mayas, the Chinese, the uh, people of ancient Egypt and Babylon and uh, back into the ancient empires, the Akkadia, why, why and what were they referring to as the bull? As we've cited to you before, that we find that over in uh, Iraq, that they, uh, as we cited, they recently dug up just prior to the beginning of the Armageddon thing that's being set up over there. I don't mean to be callous with it because I'm concerned about it, but I don't think that I can do too much about it because I don't think that I can change prophecy. The Almighty who saw the end from the beginning, but the archaeologists, the scientists, and the preachers, and the teachers, none of them have come up with an answer. Uh, why, like in Iraq, they've dug up these bulls that are three times... Uh, uh, these stone bulls, three times the size of uh, live bulls, and they have wings on their back. We've seen this in Babylon. We've seen it in Egypt. And then we see uh, statues and depictions and all of these ancient civilizations of bulls and lions with wings on their back. It's talking about a type of people from where they came in the heavens and that they flew here. They were transported to this planet. Now we left off on our last tape where we were discussing the river of the judge. If you'll bear with me, it, it may appear dry and it, it's, it's hard to present to you uh, without pictures. And, and this I apologize for, but at this present time I am one man who's trying to play the role of several men. And I know in many areas I fall terribly short. Uh, I don't have a word processor. I don't have a computer. And, uh, and later on, as I acquire these things, I can probably put it in a more orderly fashion. And uh, hopefully someday, should I live long enough, the world doesn't blow up beforehand uh, to where it will seem at that time more important things and getting out books and tapes. But I hope to get it out later on in some book forms or at least pamphlets uh, where you can just look it up and, and search it out for yourself. But anyway, we're going back to as uh, in the uh, Dendra Zodiac. It is depicted it is a river under the feet of Orion. Now remember, this ancient knowledge, we were positive that it was talked by Enoch, who took uh, trips to the heavens, brought these records back, left it for man to understand, to look to the past, the present, and to the future, and to draw great hope and inspiration, and know that there's a day of restitution of all things. So now we find in the Dendra Zodiac, it is a river under the feet of Orion. It was named uh, P-E-H-T-A-T, Fetati, which means the mouth of the river. Now, 
according to the Britannica uh, catalog, uh, uh, Bollinger says, it consists of 84 stars, one of the first magnitude, one of the second, eighth and the third, and so forth. But the brightest star at the mouth of this uh, river as it's depicted, it bears the ancient name of uh, Archnar, A-C-H-E-R-N-A-R, which is which is in, as its name means, the after part of the river. The next star B at the source of the river is named Cursa, C-U-R-S-A, which means bent down. And we have shown you about the allegory bent down of those that came down, bent the knee, the allegory, the idiom of the foot and the footstool and stepping down. Bent down, those that are coming down here. The next at the second bend in the river is called uh, Zurak, Z-O-U-R-A-C. It's Aramaic. It means flowing. Other stars not identified are uh, Phet, uh, P-H-E-A-T, at uh, mouth. That means like the mouth of a river. And Oza, O-Z-A-H, the going forth. Hence then we have a river flowing forth from the glorious Orion, now, it runs in a serpentine course towards the lower regions, down, down, out of sight, and in vain the uh, sea monster, uh, Cetus, C-E-T-U-S, he, he strives to stop its flow. In other words, was this referring to uh, ancient days when they tried to, uh, because remember uh, Cain and uh, his people, or was talking about a type of people, they were kicked out. They came here, and they gained control of this planet. Was this referring to a time that they had the ability and the technology that they were trying to stop the invasion of the Semitic people, the sons from the bull? Or is it referring, as we have implied in other tapes, that they're going to go out, all of these nations, to war against the Almighty? They're going to try to stop Him coming. What a ridiculous thought, but... Hey, the madness that is upon this earth today, like as we quoted uh, from the book of Daniel and uh, the footnotes, uh, let's see, the Companion Bible, I believe it was, uh, where the prophecy says they shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Well, in the Companion Bible, the footnotes, it says man shall run to and fro. In other words, we can fly from New York to California in just a few brief hours. But then they go on to say, and madness shall be increased. And I think that's quite apparent. Well, anyway, it goes on to say, It is the river of the judge and speaks of that final judgment when the wicked shall be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, it was evidently originally associated with fire for the Greek myths through gross perversion still connected to it. According to their fables, something went wrong with the chariots of the sun. In other words, the spaceships and I believe the sun, because nobody is silly enough to think that they came from uh, our sun, but as we said before, I believe they called Venus the sun in ancient times. So according to their fable, something went radically wrong with the chariots of the sun, and a universal con uh, flagration was threatened in the uh, uh, trouble. Uh, uh, Phaeton... P-H-A-E-T-U-N, probably a reference to the star Phet, P-H-E-A-T, was killed and he was hurled into this river in which he was consumed with its fire. Now the whole earth suffered from such a burning heat that great disaster ensued. Now we see from this myth two great facts preserved in the perverted uh, tradition uh, that was called judgment and fire. Aradius, A-R-A-T-U-S, uh, also preserves the connection. For yonder trod by heavenly fate, when the scorched water of Erandus, tear-swollen flood, welling beneath Orion's uplifted foot. Now, is not this the testimony afterward written in the book? Daniel sees this very river in his vision of that coming day when the true Orion shall come forth in his glory. 
So if there's a true Orion came forth, a great judge, a great lord of space, so uh, we know that the adversary must have been an imitator and deceived the people, uh, that uh, he was the redeemer and the a Messiah, and etc., the false Christ. So, as we said, Daniel sees this very river in his vision of the coming day when the true Orion shall come forth in his <coughs> glory. And he says, I beheld till the thrones were placed, and one that was ancient of days did set. His throne, his throne, was fiery flames and the wheels thereof burning fire. He's talking about the throne of the Almighty. He's talking about Venus, the third heaven, the garden, and the wheels uh, like burning fire, fiery chariots. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. This is the river of the judge. For he goes on to say the judgment was set and the books were open. Now, if you want to search that out, it's in Daniel uh, 7, verses 9 to 11, and the Revised Version. Then we have the same uh, as we find back in the book of Psalms, which describes the scene when the Lord shall reign. A fire goeth before him, and burneth up his adversaries round about his lightnings lighted the world, the earth saw and trembled, and the hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. So again in Psalms 1 and 3 we read, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be temptuous round about him. And then we find by Habakkuk he speaks of the coming of the Lord, and he describes it thus, it's written, his brightness was as the light. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals uh, went forth at his feet. That's Habakkuk 3 and 5. What is this? But Orion and Eridanus. Eridanus. Again it is written in Isaiah 30, verses 27 to 33 in Revised Version. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from afar burning with his anger and thick rising smoke. His lips are full of indignation. His tongue is a devouring fire. In other words, his lips of indignation and devouring fire. He gives the command. This is the time. You, my celestial armies, under the command of Michael, the great archangel, you go forth and now you commence to destroy my enemies. And his tongue is a devouring fire, and his breath is an overflowing stream, in parentheses, of fire. For top hith, T-O-P-H-E-T-H, -E is prepared of old. Yea, for the king, parentheses, Moloch, is made ready. He hath made it deep and large, and the pile thereof is fire and much wood, and the breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. In other words, he's talking about the pile of fire that these adversaries of the ancient god Moloch, the same people that worship them, I believe, that have taken over uh, and rule uh, their descendants do of uh, China and Russia and so forth, that they have heaped up the wood and the fire for this great Moloch. In other words, symbolics of uh, weapons of war. But when it speaks of the Lord like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Now, that may be hard to understand. As we have spoke in times past, when Venus passed in close proximity of the earth, blocking out the sun as at the time of the Exodus, and also as we described in Joshua's long day, once again, the house of the Almighty, the uh, the altar, the house, the palace, the Mount Zion of heaven. It passed in close proximity. But my friends, again, this is a long tirade that we could go off on. But you go back and you read Ezekiel very carefully. When he talks about out of heaven, 
outer space. It talks about uh, these cubits of stone as they're described. Some of them 50 cubits. Now a cubit is 25 inches. And he says, fire and brimstone shall rain out of heaven. These are the accumulation of these sulfured uh, rocks and dervish that has built up on the surface of Venus as uh, the, what was the pioneer, I think, that filmed it. And they saw these cracks all over it, and they thought that the surface there of indentations and so forth was only like 12 feet deep. Now, why did they say that? And then they talk about two giant structures, see, like they were equated as horns by the ancient, so it must have been pretty close to this planet, and the clouds must have gone away from it as it moved at high speed, close to the earth. So they must have seen these horns of the altar. Now, at this time, where else are all of these stones going to rain out of heaven? And so when these blocks that... Uh, well, even our recent scientists, they said that it's at these two structures, which they said, well, it has to be volcanoes. But my friends, all the scientific garbledy gook they said about Venus, well, what little pictures they did get, it didn't show that their premise was correct. They were shocked that it had a very smooth, round surface to it. And they said it is emitting sulfur from these volcano structures. But, my friends, if this great space station coming in close proximity, interrupting the gravitational pull of this planet, and those do fall to our Earth, big chunks of this from off that space station, this outer shell, and then when that sulfur, this is where you get the ancient word brimstone, one and the same, this is what you make gunpowder with, you have to use sulfur, but when it breaks through our ionosphere, and comes into our atmosphere, then my friend, these big rocks are going to be on fire. And it says that they're going to fall upon our enemies. Now, so again we read in Nahum 1, verses uh, 5 and 6, I believe was, The mountains quake in him, and the hills melt and the earth is burned up at his uh, presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein, who can stand before his indignation, who can abide in the fierceness of his anger, his fury is poured out like fire. But remember, my friend, those of you that are faithful, you remember what Solomon said? I believe we quoted that in Star Wars our tape on Star Wars, where he said, I will protect you from the cloud. Anyway, in Isaiah, we read, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. This, we agree, the New Testament Scripture speaks of the day of the Lord when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance upon them that know not He and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in Second Thessalonians 1, uh, verses 7 and 8. This is the true uh, Eridanius E-R-I-D-A-N-U-S. There is no more picture. It is a dread reality. It is written in stars of fire and words of truth that men may heed the solemn warning and flee from the wrath to come. But we ask, Who may abide in the day of His coming and who shall stand when He appeareth? Malachi 3.2 Who can stand before His indignation when his fury is poured out like fire the question is given in the next picture this is one that should give us some comfort a u r i g a it means the shepherd 
and it speaks of safety for the redeemed in the day of wrath. Remember what I've told you before? Uh, whenever you read a paragraph or two of bad news, it's always followed with some good news. Here it is presented to us in the answer to the question, Who may abide in the day of His coming? Behold, the Lord God will come as a mighty one, with His arm shall uh, rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and His recompense before Him. He shall feed His flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in His arm, and He shall carry them in His bosom, and shall gently lead those that give suck. Let's see, I believe this is uh, found in I, uh, Isaiah. But my friend, carry them in his bosom. That seems like an insignificant little word. But you remember in ancient antiquity when Job said he came forth from the bosom of the Father and the womb of the morning. Sounds like he's going to take some special little lambs there that he's going to protect them and take them and as symbolized in the astronomy of the ancients, they show the Redeemer holding the little lamb. Anyway, this is exactly what is presented before us in the last section of the chapter which tells of the coming judgment. Now we've had the picture of a mighty bull that's rushing forth with a great river the judge. Now we see a great shepherd. He is seated upon the Milky Way holding up his left shoulder, a she-goat. She clings to his neck and looking down, affrighted at the terrible rushing bull. Now, in his left hand, he supports two little kids, apparently just born and bleeding and trembling with fear. Now, Rada, he says this, she is both large and bright, but they, the kids, shine somewhat feebly in Argea's waist, A-U-R-I-G-A-S. Is not this the great shepherd gathering the lambs in his arms, carrying them in his bosom? Is he not saying, I will save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey? We find that in Ezekiel uh, 34 and 22. And then we go on, and uh, uh, and David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. That's Jeremiah 23 and 4. Now, uh, a riga, a uriga, however you want to pronounce this, is from a Hebrew root, which means a shepherd. It is a beautiful constellation of 66 stars, one of the first magnitude, uh, two of the second, nine of the fourth. The brightest star in the body of the goat points her out as a prominent feature in the constellation for the name Alioth. Hebrew, it means a she-goat. She, uh, she is known by the uh, Latin term called uh, Capella, C-A-P-E-L-A, -E which has the very same meaning. Now the next star B and the shepherd's right hand is called uh, Menkilinon, M-E-N-K-I-L-I-N-O-N, -E and that means the band or the chain of the goats, and points out the truth that they are never more to be lost again, but to be bound with the bands of love to the shepherd forevermore. Now the name of another star is uh, Maz, M-A-A-Z, which means a flock of goats. Now can there be any, any mistake as to who this shepherd is? For the bright star on the right foot is called El Nath, like another in Aries, which means wounded or slain. This is he, then, who was once bruised or wounded in the heel. He is the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. As in John uh, 10, verse 11, he was the great shepherd brought again from the dead, as we find mentioned in Hebrews, uh, and is now the chief shepherd as 
uh, First Peter uh, 5 and 4 sees in the day of his coming glory. Another star, it emphasizes the truth, for it is the name of A-I, uh, A-I-Yuk, A-I-Y-U-K, and it also means wounded in the foot. Now the star marking the kids, uh, you know, the young goats, is uh, Gedi, G-E-D-I, it's Hebrew, it means kids. In Latin, the word uh, uh, Riga, it means a coachman or charioteer. Uh-huh. The band in his right hand being taken as his reins. But the incongruity here of a charioteer carrying a she-goat, nursing two little kids, never struck them, nor did the fact that he has no chariot and no horses. When men blunders in the things of God, he does it thoroughly, Bollinger says. And the Zodiac of Dendra, the same name was revealed more than 4,000 years ago. But the man, instead of carrying a sheep, is carrying a scepter. It is called Tirun, T-R-U-N, which means scepter or power. And this is a great scepter, for at the top of it has the head of a goat, and the bottom below, the hand that holds it, ends in a cross. Uh, with the Egyptians, the cross was a sign of life. They knew of nothing of the death of the cross. And here we see life and salvation uh, uh, for the sheep of his flock, which he comes to reign and rule in judgment. And the truth is precisely the same. Uh, through the presentation of it is somewhat varied. Now the connected teachings of these two constella uh, constellations, Aranidas and uh, Ariga, is solemnly set forth in Malachi. Uh, Malachi, uh, let's see, 4, 1 to 3 from the revised version. Behold, the day cometh, it burneth as a furnace, and all the proud and all that work wickedness shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up with the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and gambol as G-A-M-B-O-L as calves of the stall, you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do make. Well, also it means do this, says the Lord of hosts. Now in Psalms uh, 35, let's see, 37, this day is repeatedly referred to as the day when the wicked shall be cut off, and it concludes by summarizing the same great truth. Now, quoting from uh, verses uh, 3840, Revised Version, as for the transgressors, they shall be destroyed together. The latter end of the world, or the end of the wicked, shall be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. My friends, your preacher's going to hate this. But righteousness means law keepers. But the salvation, in other words, uh, and salvation from the word satori is mean brought to a place of safety of the law keepers is of the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble, and the Lord helpeth them and rescueth them. He rescueth them from the wicked and saveth them because they have taken refuge in Him. Oh, that all who would read these pages, Bullinger says, may heed the solemn warning and flee for refuge to Him who is now in this day of grace is crying, Look unto me and be saved, all you the ends of the earth. So we find this quoted from uh, the prophet Isaiah. Now for those that would like another witness outside of astronomy, outside of the Bible, as we quoted Josephus in our other tapes prior to this, uh, the tapes called uh, Calling Eve a Nut, we have the 
A lot of people are not aware of it, but Josephus, the, uh, he was called a great Jewish historian. Uh, he wrote a book also called The Jewish Wars. And I would like to quote to you about judgment that came on that great city of Jerusalem. Uh, we quote uh, from the very last verse, starting page 360 and 361. There's a really interesting account there. Uh, remember that this was back around 37 A.D. that he was captured. Now, they say that Josephus, he was a Galilean. So he lived in Galilee, which was quite a distance from Jerusalem. And so I don't think you could call him a Jew or a Judean because we don't know that he was one of those that came back in the dispersion that was living in that area. I would say we'd call him an Israelite. I'm not sure what it says, what tribe he's from. But we find... He's uh, writing and speaking of the Jewish wars. He said, First a star stood over the city like a broad sword and a comet that remained a whole year. Then before the revolt and the movement to war, while the people were assembling for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now you remember, my friends, I think I have said in some of my tapes, that when I <clears throat> say that once again Venus, uh, as in the Exodus and the other times, uh, the wars of Joshua and so forth, I believe that there's going to be a certain time that a lot of this is going to take place as we know the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They had that just prior to the Passover when the children were to leave Israel. So here I think is a an account that verifies that there are certain times to watch for. And so the unleavened bread was just before the Passover. So it appears maybe something passed over at the time of Josephus and the destruction of the temple and so forth. Let me go back now. Then before the revolt and the movement to war, while the people were assembling for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the 8th of... X-A-N-T-H-I-C-O-S. They said at 3 a.m. So bright a light shone around the altar and the sanctuary that might have been midday. The last half of the hour, the inexperienced took it for a good omen. But the sacred scribes at once gave an interpretation uh, which the event brought right during the well, well, we'll skip a little bit on down here. And it goes on. And it talks about the temple guard ran with the news to the captain who came up and with great uh, effort managed to shut it. He's talking about the doors of the temple. This, like the other, seemed to the laity to be the best of omens. But hath not God opened to them the gate of happiness? Were they refer Was this a re uh, reference to... This was a sign that the door to paradise was once again going to be open and so forth. Well, what I should do, and I, I didn't want to put it in, uh, but I'll go ahead and do it. But uh, I hate to have anybody discount the testimony here because it sounds so goofy. There may or there may not be any validity to it. But I uh, give you another example it uh, used an ancient idiom from the great Assyrian tablets where it talked about Cain. And he wrote in one of his tablets about his great rule and so forth. But he knew that when a lamb would give birth to a lion, his kingdom would come to an end. And so you see the ancient idiom, idiom the allegory of the Virgin Mary being one of the lambs or the sheep of God, that she gave birth to Christ, who was the Lion of Judah. But anyway, let's go back to what this guard comes in uh, telling about. During the feast, it said a cow brought by someone to be sacrificed gave birth to a lamb in the middle of the temple courts. Well, at midnight, it was 
observed that the east gate of the inner court had opened of its own accord, a gate made of bronze and so solid that every evening twenty strong men were required to shut it. It was fastened and, uh, with iron-bound bars and secured by bolts, uh, which were lowered a long way into the threshold, fashioned from a single slab of stone. Now, my friends, was this an allegory here, talking about a cow giving birth to a lamb? Now, we say that that's ridiculous, that's impossible. But we're finding now that women who have gone past the age of childbirth, that they can now implant into them, uh, causing them to give a birth or have birth even beyond their years. Well, we, we, we spoke of that, and I won't dwell on that. But this was this an old idiom: the cow or the bull was given birth to a lamb. Well, I don't know. I'll leave it to you. But it goes on to say the temple guards they ran with the news to the captain who came up with great effort, managed to shut it. This, like the other, seemed to the laity to be the best of omens. Had not God opened to them the gate of happiness? Was, were they figuring this, they were soon going to go back to paradise, Venus? <laughs> but the learned perceived that the security of the sanctuary was dissolving of its own accord and the opening of the gate was a gift to the enemy, and they admitted their hearts that the sign was a potent of desolation. A few days after the feast, on the 21st of our uh, Timios, a supernatural apparition was seen, too amazing to be believed. What I have to relate would, I suppose, have been dismissed as an invention had it not been vouched for by eyewitnesses and followed by disasters that bore out the sign. Before sunset there was seen in the sky over the whole country chariots, in other words flying saucers, and regiments in arms speeding through the clouds and encircling the town. Again, at the Feast of Pentecost, when the priests had gone into the inner court of the temple at night to perform the usual ceremonies, they declared that they were aware first of a violent movement and a loud crash, then of concerted cry, Let us go hence. So again, it sounds once again like the uh, watchers of heaven, as we described before, that they were anxious to be on their way. Now, you can take that for whatever it's worth. Now, we're going to deal just very briefly with this sign that we find in the heavens among the constellations, and it's known as Ara, which means the altar. We're only going to deal with it briefly, and then we're going to go back to the uh, first kings of the earth. We're going to go back to the Vikings and so forth and touch briefly on what they say about our Thor and the bull of heaven and so forth. But I think this is a very important point here. And so as I say, we'll just deal with this briefly and move right along. The altar, it represents a consuming fire that's prepared for his enemies. Here we have an altar, a burning prior, placed significantly and very ominously upside down. This fire is burning and pointing towards the lower region called Tartarius, or the abyss, or outer darkness. So you see, now this is what Bullinger says. Now this confirms the point that I made that the ancients call this planet Tartarius, the abyss, or outer darkness. We're living on the outside of our planet. And just beyond the ionosphere, we are surrounded by darkness. Now, it is an asterism with nine stars, of which three are the third magnitude, four of the fourth, and so forth. It is south of the scorpion's tail. And when these constellations were first formed, it was visible only from the very lowest horizon of the south, 
pointing to the completion of all judgment in the lake of fire. And the zodiac of Dendra, we have a different picture, giving us another aspect of the same judgment. It is a man enthroned with a flail in his hand. His name is Bayu, B-A-U, the same name as that Hercules has, and it means he cometh. It is from the Hebrew word bo, B-O-H, to come, as in Isaiah 63 and 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? Now, you see, the church world today has no idea. They haven't the foggiest idea who he's talking about, who he's going to deal with. Goes on to say that he's coming in judgment and is clear for the reason given in verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come and I looked and there was none to help and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation and my fury it upheld me. That's Isaiah 63, 4 and 5. Now the completion of judgment, therefore, is what is pictured both by the burning prior and the coming one and throne and his thrashing instrument. You remember Christ and Matthew and Luke and so forth through there, I believe it is. He talks about the world as a field. Let the wheat and the tares grow together. Tares is something that's red. They turn red at the harvest symbolic of Edom. He said, let them grow together until the harvest time. Then I will send in the reapers. In other words, to cut the wheat down, to burn them up. Now he goes on the completion of judgment, therefore, as what is uh, figuratively is what is pictured by both the burning prior and the coming one and thrown with his thrashing instrument. In the Aramaic, it's called al mug amra M U G A M R A, which means the completing or the finishing. The Greeks use the word ara, A R A, or ara, sometimes in the sense of praying, but more frequently in the sense of uh, imprecation or cursing. This is the curse pronounced against the great enemy. It is the burning fire pointed to the completion of that curse, which uh, he shall cast down that everlasting fire. You may want to go back and listen to the tape again. Remember, my friends, unless you have a, a, a different uh, side to uh, continue with our discussion here about the Holy Grail. Now, my friends, what I find so utterly fascinating as we go along, I wonder why these old historians, and maybe they, uh, maybe they weren't familiar with the history of Peru and of the Americas. As we say that it appears that there was worldwide commerce, I believe, that extended from uh, ancient Egypt, both Upper and Lower Egypt, that extended not only to Africa or remote parts of Africa, but I believe to Europe and to the Americas. As we go along here, <coughs> pardon me, what I think is so fascinating, there seems to be a great correlation, as later on I want you to keep this in mind as we get into the uh, chronicles of the uh, <clears throat> ancient account of the uh, of Genesis as taken from the Chaldean. Now keep in mind that when we use like Strong's Concordance and others, they're constantly refer referring to the Hebrew Chaldean dictionaries and lexicons. And uh, many of the scholars say that it's the ancient Aramaic, but I think that it extends beyond the time going back even before Ishmael, the uh, son of uh, Abraham, who became the father of what we know as the Arab nations today. 
But we have to remember that he had this son by a bondswoman. In other words, she was like, well, she was in bondage to him. We don't know what reason why, whether she was a captive slave or just what she was. We don't know for sure genetically who she was, of possibly some very ancient people that were predecessors to the Semitic people. We find many mysteries as uh, just in the last month or two here in the 1990 edition I was reading some articles in the National Geographic and they were talking about the Dagon people in the areas of Africa where they live. And unfortunately, they're losing their culture. Uh, approximately 35% of them have converted to uh, the Muslim religion. And so they're losing their heritage. But uh, what I found very interesting in this article, it talked about the Tulemen, or Tulem, T-U-L-L-E-M, I believe is the way they spelled it. And it put me in mind, phonetically, it uh, came very close to the ancient accounts of what they call uh, in the Chaldean the Tulemen. And it seems very much to me like they were talking about a people whose history is so ancient that it went back to other worlds and planets. Now, the uh, some of the very old people of the tribe that hung on to the history of the ancients and the Tulum that inhabited the area uh, now called Mali, which was originally French Guiana, uh, they spoke of these m mysterious people who had the magic uh, that enabled them to fly. Now, I don't think it's an old myth, but I think that somewhere in their recorded history is talking about a people that <coughs> came to that area that still had a great technology and probably the ability to fly. Were they pilgrims uh, from other worlds who had come in and lived there for uh, several hundred years and disappeared as suddenly as they came? Then I would like to have you keep in mind as we read a lot of these words from the ancient kings here on this earth, uh, we can't help but wonder if there isn't as we go to the Chaldean account if their predecessors were not the original pilgrims who came to this earth because we hear about the uh, great ancient kings that were considered gods or descended gods and we find that they were called from Tillamon, who I believe that we will uh, prove uh, were from the ancient worlds. And then as we read names like you do and these old accounts from India and so forth, uh, yet the accounts go back to the time of what uh, the church world calls the pre-Diluvian age, which I think in further... Uh, studies here, we're going to prove that uh, this was actually talking about the wars of the worlds, which we will prove conclusively. We'll deal with part of it in this chapter, that uh, these people did truly indeed, uh, you do, that they were descendants of you too, that we've discussed in other chapters. And then we're going to... Uh, uh, deal with a character called a sage or say Gaga. Now I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt if we were to trace it down as I made what appears to be a very outrageous claim that the original cradle of civilization uh, was actually in Peru. Now listen carefully and think about this. You say why do I come up with this say Gaga? Now, I think that it's just a different uh, phonetical spelling. As we're dealing with this cauldron, what is called the Holy Grail, the Sacred Bowl, which was reminding them of a place and space from which they came. It was a uh, fetish emblem, for lack of a, a, a better description. But in here, we're going to deal with the fact that it was buried in one of the ancient temples of the sun god, which puts us in mind of Lake Titicaca, which is in Peru. And we find that um, 
and researching it out in the old language, what that meant was uh, the holy stone, the holy rock. And I believe here when they're talking about this, say, gaga, that it was like kaka, which meant a sacred stone, or he who came from the sacred bowl. Because why else would they name this lake high up in the mountains, Lake Titicaca? Why would they call it the holy stone? Uh, in referring to a lake. Was this referring to a people who came from the holy rock as the ancients also referred to the planets in outer space and specifically uh, Venus, which I think that they referred to as the sun god because uh, modern uh, linguists and uh, religious interpreters, they fail to understand the ancient etymology of the language where they equated rulership to the sun and the moon and the stars. As we've cited before, King David referred to the moon and to the stars, but he did not refer to the sun as that ancient title was applicable to him. For he set as the sun, as the brightest of the stars which are in our galaxy, <clears throat> showing and representing that he was the unquestioned ruler at that particular period of time. And we find another clue here as the uh, Yudu stone bowl uh, referred to as a holy grail and also it's referred to as a boiling cauldron. In other words, a round pot that is boiling. Uh, so a boiling pot could have like uh, steam coming off of it representing the veil as it was referred to in the ancient parable of the temple. And the veil or the clouds, uh, the veil represented the clouds that hid the holy of holies as this holy grail, the holy bowl. And I think that without going into a lot of detail, uh, Christ was referring to it in a language that uh, the religious world has long failed to understand that when he was faced with death upon the cross and the crucifixion, he said, let not this cup, I think he's referring to the holy bowl to his house as uh, his unquestioned leadership. He uh, prayed as an example that this should not pass from him, that he would continue to be the ruler of it. Now, when we go into the sun god, as we're going to be dealing with as these ancient kings from all over the world and as recorded in the records from India to Egypt, and so forth, that uh, where they're speaking of this holy bowl, a modern man has failed to understand that it represents the New Jerusalem, the holy city, uh, Venus, the ancient name Lucifer, the bright, shiny star. Man has failed to understand that, but here's what is so interesting as we get into this, we're going to see where it was hid in an ancient city of the sun god, also where they spoke of Ra, and I think the ancient Egyptians and the early Hebrews and the Semitic people, they referred to the ever-living, the Almighty, as Ra, uh, the God of all. But <clears throat> getting back to Peru for just a moment, uh, just a very few miles from Lake Titicaca, we have the great city of Tiwanaku. And you have to go through an arched, uh, entrance as you go into it. You've probably seen the picture in Von Donniken's books and some of the others where they have this sun god representing Ra, the ancient god of the ancient city of space, uh, Venus, if you like, uh, where it shows tears coming out of his eyes at the top of the archway and he seems to be uh, weeping over what seems to be lesser gods or his sons below him, who apparently it represents those who were fallen or taken to Tartarius or the lower world, as the Egyptians called it by both, uh, or this blue planet as we now define it. And so, as we cited before, inside in a, what was once a, a very large hallway, they had the representation on the wall of both the uh, black man and those that appeared to be very Nordic and those that looked like the ancient Egyptians. And it seems that every 
race and nation and every species and subspecies of man is carved upon those walls. So how and why, how was this great commerce and this great travel among all the nations, how was it uh, carried out? We don't know. Now to continue on, as we go back to the ancient records of King Udu and his stone bowl or the stone cauldron of Thor, uh, T-H-O-R, and the Holy Grail of the historical King Arthur, T-H-U-R. Now we have to keep in mind that once again, here we have again the tie-in of the heavenly bull, Arthur, which in the ancient times meant the bull. Or as we just went through Bullinger's uh, Thor explaining the bull of heaven uh, rushing across, <coughs> and pardon me with his horns bent low as in a charge or coming. Now the sacred uh, trophy stone bowl of the first Sumerian king, uh, Yukuzai or Dur or Tur, T-U-R. It's D-U-R or T-U-R is pronounced uh, both ways, and we wonder about this ancient <coughs> Sumerian king here, uh, you, uh, Kushi, uh, U-K-U-S-I. And as we went into eventually about, I think it was in the 25th dynasty, uh, where, <coughs> who was it, Isaiah, we quoted there, and he talked about these people that came in that were called the Kush or the Kushi. Uh, which apparently were uh, a race of black people who finally took over Egypt there. And I think they held it for three or four decades is all the time that they held it. But they continue on, and as uh, the people of Cush are these black people, now what do we know this ancient king here? Uh, he was probably Semitic. He may have been as... Uh, uh, Let's see who my uh, Josephus. He truly may have been right where he said that the uh, very ancient people who took over Egypt were of a Semitic people. But it seemed then when these people of the Cush, as later on uh, black people, apparently uh, usurped the name and took over, they continued on in the religion of uh, the ancient uh, Egyptians, and they tried to. Uh, they took over their religions, they uh, started to speak the language, and they tried to restore Egypt to all of its ancient glory and pattern themselves after it. Now we find that this Thor, he's described as later uh, dictated to the later by the imperial king of the first Aryan dynasty, and it is now disclosed as the actual... Uh, uh, material original of the famous vanished Holy Grail of King Arthur and the famous war trophy, the magical stone bowl or cauldron that was captured from what they call the Weirdies at the well of uh, Urid, U-R-D, or also at times they, they say uh, U-R-U-D-U, Urudu by King Herthor. Then later on, it's H-E-R-T-H-O-R, as uh, detailed in what they call the Nordic Eddies. And these were probably the progenitors of what they call the Norsemen, and a lot of them who were Vikings, who wore the strange, even the biblical account gives the men that wore these strange iron hats with horns. And I think that they were doing this to, to commemorate and to show their fa uh, fierceness, to scare their enemies, but it also showed that they were the people who came from space from the great bull. Now we find that this great cauldron or this holy grail, it was unearthed in a fragmentary condition, but with its inscription practically intact by the Pennsylvania University expedition from deep down below uh, the foundations of the central tower of the oldest sun temple in Mesopotamia at Nippur, N-I-P-P-U-R, on the old channel of the Euphrates, south of Babylon. Now, where it had been deposited, they 
they believed by the fourth king and the great grandson of King Dur, Thor, or Arthur, about 3,245 B.C. Now this is a spot that had been previously inspected by me, so this uh, author of this book, uh, Waddell, says. Uh, <clears throat> and he said, The fragment of this famous magic bowl bearing that inscription is now in my possession. Now remember, as we quoted before from the Egyptian writings, they talked about the magic that went on inside of the bull. In other words, the great science and the laboratories. And uh, we probably don't have any comprehension because we're probably, uh, to equate it would be to most of us, not all of you, but it would be like a caveman uh, contemplating Cape Canaveral and a moonshot. But we find this, ma uh, this uh, very famous magic stone bowl of King Dar or Dur or uh, Sag, S-A-G-G, -G, or uh, Sakai, S-A-K-H. Now the large fragment of which was inscribed is great-grandson King Yudu of Kish with a genealogy of the latter back to the first king and deposited by him beneath the central tower of the oldest sun temple in Mesopotamia at Nippur. Now it's frequently referred to an earlier Sumerian sacred literature as one of the most celebrated of war trophies captured by the first king. Now who did he capture it from? There's a great mystery here. And significantly, it is specially associated therein with the first Sumerian king under his Sekha, uh title earlier, Seg, as written on the bowl. This is the Sig, S-I-G, title of Thor in the Nordic Eddies. Thus the first Sumerian, uh, Sumerian king under the Sakai title in the Bengali Sumerian and the Babylonian glossaries where uh, Sakha, S-A-K-H, is shown to be the equivalent of Seg or Segaga and of Adar in the uh, uh, later Babylonians. Now we can't help but wonder about this Adar and Atan and Etan and these names that are uh, pronounced and spelled phonetically a little different, but there seems to be a great uh, similarity as we trace it. Uh, from Nineveh to Babylon, you know, Nineveh's in uh, uh, Iraq and so forth. But Sakai is the equivalent of Seg or Segaga of Adar, the later Babylonian, uh, is called the Lord of King Sakha. Uh, then they go to Yugu, U-G-U, the king of the precious stone, the hidden vessel of Kishland. Now the king of that hidden or disappeared vessel. It is also, now get this, the serpent stone vessel. Now in the Bible it talks about the, uh, Revelation 12, the great red dragon. And we find and we've proved that uh, throughout secular history and throughout uh, uh, biblical history that the serpent and the old dragon were one and the same. It represented those who came in spaceships from outer space. But later on, because uh, uh, the heathen picked it up, and then it, after periods of time, the true history of the great antiquity and the serpent cults and the great dragons and what they represented were forgotten, so men started to worship cobras and different types of snakes and so forth. But this bowl is disclosed by our new evidence to have been the central fetish, magical stone bow of the aboriginal uh, Chaldean serpent worshippers. They violently opposed the establishment of King Dur or Seg civilization with its bland sun worship which destroyed the immoral uh, debasing superstition of these serpent and lion worshippers. Now see, later on they forgot, as we're going to get back into the book of Kings, and we find that li uh, flying lions were represented 
uh, in the holy uh, tabernacle of the ancient Israelites. But see, we forgot what that meant. And so they're debasing superstitions of these serpent and lion worshippers and their animal and human sacrifices of devil worship and their uh, swarms of wizards and weirdies and the mother-son cult. Uh, now, <clears throat> you, you might want to get the book that I described, The Two Babylons, which is still available <clears throat> in some bookstores, and they trace that mother-son cult back to Nimrod, who was called the first great hunter, which I suspect <clears throat> was a half-Semitic man, and he was possibly one of the uh, descendants of the great Khan, or the Cain who was originally kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and he uh, had usurped the title of a, a god-man. Now I would like to go back for just a minute and clear up the word Adar. According to Waddell's footnotes, he says, uh, Adar, we shall find in the Babylonian form... Uh, to originally have meant Indar, and later to uh, in this age we call it India. But it is also found as a form of one of Thor's titles in the Nordic Eddies. So we see throughout antiquity how things uh, get lost. Now as all these things get lost in the vagueness of antiquity, this is why we have to search throughout all of the uh, different historical and religious and uh, writings of the ancient worlds, but I think that as we follow down now the original possessors of this stone bowl, they lost it, and then as we said that the, uh, these devil worshippers, and as Waddell puts it, the swarms of wizards and weirdies, weirdies is what they were called, uh, the people that had this mother-son cult, now he goes and he says that they were to terrorize the people, yet later, nevertheless, uh, implicitly believe their sources as the serpent and the lions were the totems of their tribe. Now this this gets really good here because I, I want to quote you one of their poems. We find that the uh, capture of this central fetish bowl of the serpent lion cult is, is thus uh, celebrated in a Babylonian copy of a fine old Sumerian hymn wherein the later Babylonians have made Adar the son of King Saka instead of himself. And so, see, they've distorted it, uh, just like the people of Cush when they came in and they took over Egypt. They took on their uh, language, they took on their religion, uh, they took credit for the pyramids, and many times they went and chiseled off the names of the original founders and creators of the uh, temples and the uh, pyramids and the great edifices and stamp their own name on. So the archaeologists have been able to uh, ferry that out, so to speak. But then, even though they distorted it and changed the name here, uh, and, and the uh, Sumerians and the Babylonians, or the uh, Babylonians, uh, uh, took from this fine old Sumerian hymn, they changed it somewhat. But with this foregoing background, we can still see enough evidence here that these people truly were from the great Thor, the great bull of space, the great house of the Almighty. Now, let's see as, as we cite this poem to you if we can't get some clues here. Quoting now, The tooth of the lion and the mighty serpent of Ilu. I-L-U. Thou, Adar, now remember... It was Thor, our Thor. Thou, uh, Adar, or Thor, removest, making them to turn away from the land. In other words, as this talking about an ancient king, one of the Adam or the Semitic or Cain, as this referring to them, that was kicked out of the planet. Now, to turn away from the land. Now remember the ancient wordy rats which could mean that world or that planet or land. But I suspect it's talking about kings, the flying lions, and those that came in the mighty spaceships instead of serpent. Uh, let's uh, go on now where they use the word Adar and remember Thor or our Thor. Uh, Adar the king, the son of the god Sakai, has caused 
and then he puts in parentheses, question mark, them, to turn unto, and question mark, so he puts in the word themselves. But I don't think that's what it originally implied, but uh, there's a couple words left out there. Then he goes on to say, He is the warrior who lasso overthrows the foe. O Adar, or Arthur, the fear of thy shadow inclines towards the earth. In other words, thy shadow. He's talking about something that came down that flew over the earth that caused a shadow. He assembles the people in strength to invade the hostile land. Adar, or let's put in Arthur, the warrior who knows not fear has driven away the pest. Or was he one of those? Is this referring here? Arthur, is it talking about one of the great lords of space, one of the great watcher ships? Uh, remember where he said he put the uh, uh, cherubims that were like a turning flaming sword to guard the entrance so they could no longer enter in again? Is this referring to uh, these ancient uh, cherubims, carubs or carubims, that has driven away the pest. Now listen, Arthur the warrior who knows not fear, now could even refer to Michael, has driven away the pest. The strong Daru, D-A-R-R-U, before whom the foe exists not. Adar, Arthur, mainly, or manly, exalter who makes joyful his side. He has driven the chariot over the mountain and has scattered wide the seed. Now you get that, my friends? The chariot. This was the ancient uh, symbol that they had nothing else to equate these spaceships to, so they're talking about the heavenly chariot. He has driven the chariot over the mountain. And we have proved uh, in the ancient writings in the Hebrew, the mountain is talking about a planet or something very high up in space and scattered wide the seed. Now, in the ancient allegories, you refer to your son and say, this is my seed. This is the fruit of my loins. As uh, King Solomon said, be careful where you plant your seed, because a woman's womb is the flower bed. So be careful where you plant your seed. So there we see the ancient allegory. It goes on. Men all together have proclaimed his name for sovereignty over them. In their midst, like a, now listen to this, in their midst, like a great wild bull has lifted up his horns. In other words, they were talking about the planet was on the moon. There was flames coming out of the horns as the ancient uh, Peruvians and Egyptians and others have described it. Now, here it gets very interesting. The shu, S-H-U, then he, they put in parentheses, vessel, stone, the precious, and then they put in parentheses, stone of the Chaldees. The strong stone, the serpent stone, the mountain stone. Now, we remember about the Egyptians, they referred to uh, shu ships. And, uh, or, or to that effect, and also the India, uh, accounts from the Mahabharata and different others, the Nagamadi and the ancient historical records of the first ancient Semitic, or at least half Semitic people of India, Adar or Indra, uh, they spoke about these ships, that they were vessels, a flying vessel. Then he goes on, the warrior, the fire stone. In other words, a planet that has fire coming out of it. Cauldron, in parentheses, to the hero has carried off to the city. Now we know the city. John said, I saw the new Jerusalem, the holy city of God. Now for those of you that would like to hear this little poem without my commentary I'll repeat it very quickly and you listen to it in order you may then this way you can <clears throat> listen to it more than once and take notes and write down your own speculation on it maybe you can add some more proof to it the tooth of the lion the mighty serpent of Ilu 
Thou, Adar, removest, making them to turn away from the land. Adar the king, the son of the great god Sakai, has caused them to turn unto, question mark, themselves. He is the warrior whose lasso overthrows the foe. O Adar, or Arthur, the fear of thy shadow inclines toward the world. He assembles the people in strength to invade the hostile land. Adar the warrior who knows not fear has driven away the pest. The strong Daru before whom the foe exists not. Adar manly exalter who makes joyful his side has driven the chariot over the mountain, has scattered wide the seed. Men all together have proclaimed his name for sovereignty over them. In their midst, like a great wild bull, has lifted up his horns. The shu, S-H-U, vessel, parentheses, stone, the precious, parentheses, stone of the Chaldees, the strong stone, the serpent stone, the mountain stone, the warrior, the fire stone, cauldron, to the hero has carried off to the city. Now you see where he talks about scattering his seed. It sounds like a great invasion here where he scattered uh, these sons of the seed all over the earth, which could uh, prove, and, and we will see later here, they went into China, they went into Peru, they went into Egypt, they went into Africa, and you remember, did not Christ himself in his parables in the New Testament, he told his children, or his uh, disciples, the world is a field. And in the field he planted good seed. And then while men slept, or were not aware of it, it says an adversary came along and planted his seed also. He called them the tares. And he said, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest time. <clears throat> we find in Waddell's footnotes, they have the word L-A-B-I, which equals lion. And then he goes on to say that it stands for uh, Mulil, M-U-L-L-I-L. It's a reading long given up is it gives its literal reading in Sakai or King Sakai. Now, if you folks will just bear with me, uh, we're not going to drag this out too long, although there's there's no end of what I would like to present here, but the whole point is that we're trying to make this uh, point is the fact that I believe that these king lists and so forth are a carryover of a genealogy that people trace back to another world before they became pilgrims here. And if you'll just bear with me, I think that we can prove this and you'll find this utterly fascinating. Now, let, let, allow me to continue on. The Nordic Eddies, they also celebrate repeatedly the capture of this stone bowl by this King Arthur, who also bears therein the title of Adar and Zig, the victorious uh, uh, dialectic form of this uh, Sumerian Sag or Sakai, uh, and significantly he also bears uh, therein the prefix title of Asa, A-S-A, -A, a lord or king, just as Sag in the bowl bears the prefix of Ash. Now, we remember as we go back to the Bible, I think in uh, 1 Chronicles 2.4, it talks about a son being born, Asher, Ashur. And I believe that this is an old name that's adopted that went back from their ancient progenitors. But allow me to continue on this Ash or lord or king, the Eddies relate that Thor is a punitive expedition against the raiding Gald, uh, which equals K-A-L-D-U, Kaldu or Kaldi, a people of the plains of Genung, 
G-I-N-U-N-G, in Mesopotamia, carried off from the weirds at the well of uh, Urid, U-R-D, at Jaro Villa, J-O-R-O-V-E-L-L-I, or Villi, uh, which we have seen was Kar Shemesh, C-A-R-C-H-E-M-I-S-H. Now, we know that uh, as we quoted, even our North American Indians and the Egyptian and all, uh, they talked about the Shemesh or the Shamish, meaning uh, uh, like, uh, we'll see, in the ancient here, it was a king priest uh, of the Lord of Heavens. But anyway, going on was seen at uh, Kar Shemesh in the upper Euphrates, their most treasured magical stone bowl or cauldron. Now, Bear with me. I think it, there's something here that is fabulous that we've missed. Now, this stone bowl or cauldron, which was the central fetish, they say, of the serpent cult. Now, the Eddies further relate how after his capture, King Thor or Zig consecrated, now get this, this life-giving stone bowl as a sacred vessel in his own sun cult. Now, was this something that was... I don't believe this was just all ignorant pagan superstition. Was there something to this that was scientific? Uh, was it some sort of an instrument that we have overlooked, like the misunderstanding of this mysterious ark that we proved was uh, actually a miniature atomic reactor? Or were they referring to the back, uh, the fact that this fetish type emblem uh, or symbol of this thing was this to remind them that when they were in Eden or in the garden of the gods if you like of the Elohim for those that may be offended by gods was it referring to they had lost their sacred home their first estate uh, which with it went immortality or, as the Egyptians said, the house of life. And the book of Revelations talks about the tree of life that was in the garden. The leaves of the trees of the, for the healing of the nation and so forth. I think we've discussed all of this. But anyway, in the sun cult, and uh, now they call it a sun cult, but it's referring once again to this bright, shiny planet of Venus, which... The word Lucifer meant a shining house or planet. Now the disappearance of this uh, great holy grail of Herthor and the futility of its quest except in vision is now accounted for uh, by its having been so deeply buried by the great grandson you do or you too. Now, as we said before, uh, this can be traced back to this mysterious Noah who we found and uh, uh, Sitzer, I believe. Um, well, my mind's gone blank here, but uh, he, in one of his books he quoted that you two, what is spoken of in the ancient pre-Diluvian age, talked about the land of the rockets. And we hear about the great God-type kings called you too. But here they go you do or you too. And then later on we find that uh, 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 Waddell here, he translates it to a later term where they got the word auto from. And we find so many of the Germanic type Europeans, they still carry over this word auto from you do or you too. <laughs> now this can be traced back, this you do or you too, at the time of, <coughs> pardon me, Waddell's writings, he said 51 centuries ago. And they found it uh, down beneath the foundations of the oldest sun temple in Mesopotamia until it was unearthed just a few decades ago. <coughs> now the identity of the, now get this, he says the identity of the Nordic or Gothic traditions uh, with the Sumerian form, still after, uh, or still another of the many striking proofs of the identity of the early Sumerians with the early Goths or Nordics, 
who were the ancestors of the Anglo-Saxon, Norse, Swede, and Britons. And it is significant that amongst the modern descendants of the later Nordics, uh, the traditional memory of the famous historical incident about 53 centuries ago has still survived through the Arthur versions of this pagan event, as he calls it, even have been modernized by later bards embellishing them, as well as King Arthur himself, uh, with Christian embroidery. Now, Waddell, he puts an interesting thing in his footnotes. He said, Thor is a late spelling of Dur, D-U-R, uh, which later occurs another spelling for Thor in the Eddies. And we see on T-H and O for U in Waoa, W-A-O-A. Now, I think later on that was uh, a Hebrew word that was picked up, was Yahua. Uh, which was, in other words, what meant Jehovah or these great extraterrestrial lords. Now, a lot of people would allow you to be cheated out of your identity and who you are, and they present the uh, Jews of Israel as the tribe of Judah. Well, what about the other lost tribes? As we've pointed out, the I in Hebrew is silent, and it was pronounced uh, for Isaac's sons, had to be children of laughter. It was six sons. So I think that the so-called lost tribes of Israel, because we're lost because of the name change, if we can keep in mind that the ancient Adamic man called a Semitic man, as he went through all of the pages of history, both secular, historical, or biblical, he had many different name changes. Some of them that were called Hebrews, some were called Israelites, uh, they were called sheep, they were called children of God, they were called Saxons. They were called many of these different things. So I think that we have been cheated out of our heritage and our genealogy. And now granted, now a lot of these people stand up and say that I am a chosen vessel of God. I'm this and I'm that. Like uh, a while back I had uh, uh, a goofy preacher come over here and told me he knew a man that was a... Um, uh, that uh, he could trace his uh, genealogy back to where he was one of the uh, ancient Levites, that he was a great priest of the law and all. And I said, I would like to see his proof of genealogy going back for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, I think that's utter hogwash. But I think one of our tests, uh, because Christ said, my sheep will not follow another. My sheep hear my voice. So <clears throat> I think although, uh, well, I had a Jewish acquaintance of mine that I had worked with, and he informed me, uh, he said, I think that I am a Jew. My family claims that they are, that they came from Israel, and so forth. But he said, I don't go along with them. He said, who knows what all blood flows in my veins? He says, because... The genealogical records were destroyed with the temple in 70 A.D. He says, so how can anybody trace their genealogy back any longer uh, as going back for centuries? Now the next tape that we're going to go to is one of my most exciting tapes, in my opinion. The material that I came up with I find utterly fascinating. And I will leave it to your discretion uh, as it tells, in my opinion, about the great engineers great, uh, in great antiquity who built uh, this space station or the house of God, the great bull that was wounded. That